Good morning. Uh, please join me for the prayer of the day. Triune God, we gather today to give praise to your holy name. Bless this, our worship of you, that it may be a sufficient offering of our thanksgiving for what you're doing in our lives, in our neighborhood, and in the world. Open our hearts to receive the good news of the gospel, that we may share it in word and deed. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we pray. Amen. Uh, please join me in the call to confession. <laughs> God calls us to honest confession, that we may be cleansed of our sin and live as a new creation, responding to God's grace by sharing it with others. Trusting in the steadfast love of our forgiving God, let us confess our sins. Holy and merciful God, uh, <laughs> we confess that we compare ourselves to one another, playing the rat race that defines worth by categories of human design, instead of practicing generous spirits that strengthen the neighborhood. We live our lives as if others have to lose in order for us to win. In the economy of your grace, there is no need to compete with one another. And yet, we admit that economy befuddles us. Forgive us when we default to destructive dispositions. Release us from the desire to judge others, which, truth be told, is often a means by which we ignore the work you're calling us to do ourselves. Free us from the fear that we are not enough. Replace that fear with hope. Hope in ourselves. Hope for our neighbors. Hope for the healing of this world. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Amen. Do we have one of our young folks that would like to pour water in the font this morning? Yeah? You want to do that, Carolyn? Come on up. And as Caroline is making her way up, do you want to note that there is a typo in the assurance of pardon. It should say in the first line of bold, I am worthy of love, not I are worthy of love. <laughs> Friends, hear the renewing waters of God's mercies. People of God, hear this good news of the gospel. You are enough. Just the way you are in your messiness, in your exhaustion, in your grieving, in your brokenness and despair, you are enough in God's eyes. I am worthy of love. We are worthy of forgiveness. All of creation is worthy of redemption. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Now that we have received that peace of Christ, uh, let us share it with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
Well, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is having a uh, wonderful uh, weekend. It's not quite as wet as the one that we had uh, last weekend, so I hope you all were able to come, go out and enjoy uh, that overdue uh, lovely weather we had yesterday. Uh, don't have many announcements this day, so we're going to keep this por portion of the worship so service brief. If you have not done so already, we invite you to sign the fellowship pads that are in your pews. Um, and the only other announcement I have is that we're beginning a new sermon series uh, today called Cues from the Pews. Been soliciting suggestions from you all over the past month or so about different topics and uh, themes and scriptures that you all would like to have addressed from the pulpit. And today is our first, uh, first installment of that series. Had a few of you all reach out about saying, you know, Pastor Stephen, I feel like I'm not enough. You know, I feel like this, I just live in this world of comparison and whether I feel like I'm not enough as a parent or not enough as a spouse or a child or a friend, coworker. how do we deal with that when we just feel inadequate? So we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, coming up in the service using um, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16. Special welcome to anyone who is joining us online this day. We are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper later on in the service. So if you are joining us from home and would like to participate and celebrate in that meal with us, with whatever elements you have nearby, you are invited to do so. So friends, let us breathe together as is our practice, and then um, Doug will lead us in our prayer for illumination. Friends, breathe in God's mercies. And breathe out God's mercies to others. Breathe in God's mercies. And breathe out God's mercies to others. And finally, breathe in God's mercies. And breathe out God's mercies to others. Friends, let us continue to worship God. Giver of all wisdom. Bless us with a double portion of your Holy Spirit to guide us in the reading, hearing, and interpreting of your word. By your grace, may we be faithful stewards of the truth you are telling the church this day. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go to the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them the equal to us, who have, who have come the burden of the day, excuse me, borne the burden of the day, and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing no wrong. You, did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It was my privilege this year to lead the communion class for our Kids Jam kids. We had four third graders join us on a Friday night when they're used to coming to church to watch a movie and eat pizza with Miss Kim, and instead they were stuck with me, <laughs> and they had to learn instead of just enjoying a movie, but they did so awesome, and I did give them pizza too. 
Um, before I call them up here, I would like to thank Miss Kim, who I know is watching today, um, for setting up all of our materials and our stations that we learned all of this information. I'd also like to thank Rebecca Conway and Robert Hickling for being there to help me facilitate the stations. And I want to thank our kiddos for being there and trying their best. I hope you enjoy their artwork that's on your bulletin today. And you'll see the stoles that they're wearing today that they made as part of their learning experience about all of the symbols that we learned. Um, at this time, kiddos, I'd like for you to come up and join me. And congregation, we're going to teach you the two most important things that we learned. Just stand right here. We learned about baptism first, and we learned that baptism means we belong, and they're going to show you a sign language that we learned for it. So hold up your hands. We belong. And you link together your pointer and your thumb. Congregation, will you try it with us? Hold up your hands. Baptism means we belong. Then we learned about communion next. Our sign for that one was we remember. Kiddos, can you show them with their thumbs? You put one thumb to your forehead, and then you put it down to touch your other thumb, which means we remember. Let's do it together. Communion means we remember. Thank you. Kiddos, I'm going to call your name. I'd like for you to come receive your certificate and stay up here for Pastor Stephen to have a prayer with us. All right. Mary Abigail Hickling. Go ahead and take that one. I'll shake this hand. <laughs> you can stay right here. Caroline Grace Conway. Josephine Lynn Pisco. And Graham Jacob Walton. My lefty. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Stephen. So well done, everyone, as we celebrate this moment. I would uh, remind all of us that the sacraments are not just something for us to understand, like a simple math equation, but rather it's kind of a beautiful mystery. And my hope is that for the rest of your lives and for all of us that we understand that the sacraments are a mystery to be explored and to be shared for the rest of our lives. So to remember, what's, how's, how do we say we remember again? We remember. So as an act of remembering, we are going to sing this song together. You see printed in your bulletin under the recognition of communion class. Um, and it is sung to a tune that I trust we all know, Jesus Loves Me. So let's sing this all together. Jesus said, remember me when the bread and wine at his table come and share Jesus' love and precious care. Lord, we remember, Lord, we remember, Lord, we remember, yes, we Let us pray. Lord, we remember you. Help us and be with us this day and every day that we celebrate the sacraments. We also pray, especially this day, for Graham, for Caroline, for Mary, and for Josephine. As they, deep, as they uh, dive deeper into the mystery of the sacraments, may your grace abide with them and abide with us every time we break this bread and pour this cup in the name of your resurrected Son, we pray. Amen. All right, y'all may be seated. Good job.
Okay. All right. Dum, dum. A man owned a vineyard and needed a crew to tend to his land. There was plenty to do. He called out to people downtown in the square, come work hard all day and I'll pay you what's fair. God, you call and you send. There is work here to do. There your whole world to tend. May we garden for you. Oh Lord, in your vineyard, may we seek to be the workers who tend to your justice and peace. He went back a number of times on that day. He called to new workers and promised fair pay. Can we but imagine those first workers rage when all whose labor receive the same wage? God, the gift of your grace comes as quite a surprise for your mercy's embrace. Even late comers' lives may all who have worked long and hard humbly learn your grace is a gift and not something we earn. He called the complainers and said, This is true, that I kept my word and I gave you your due. I share with compassion, I'm loving and kind. I care for all people and give what is mine. God, you give what is yours more than what we deserve. May we reach out in love where you call us to serve. May we who have witnessed your grace gladly share your justice and love with your world everywhere. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Brian. And thanks be to God. Brian, are you retired now? Is it this your last week? The secret's out. The secret's out. How, is it, how does it feel? Congratulations. <laughs> and as always, we're great. Not from here. No, 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 not from his. <laughs> oh, whew. All right. So, friends, as we begin this new uh, sermon series, uh, this, this conversation about being enough came out of one of our Presbyterian uh, women's circles. Um, so let us uh, uh, journey a little bit into this text and see what it has, uh, what God is saying to God's church. Let us, uh, let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So does anybody know who that is on the screen right there? Who is it? 
Brene Brown, yes, Brene Brown is an educator, a researcher, and a widely read author of, I think, six number one New York Times bestsellers, most of which are on the topics of emotional awareness, shame, vulnerability, and, uh, and leadership. If you've not read her stuff, I highly recommend her because what she writes about has to do with how we relate to one another in ways that are um, hopefully healthy, sometimes unhealthy, and the gospel at its core is nothing more or less than that. It's about relating to and with one another in ways that follow Jesus' mandate to live together in peace and compassion and justice. Now, Brene Brown and I have at least two things in common. First of all, we are both fans of the famous progressive rock band, Rush. Don't know if anybody else here are Rush fans. You either love Rush or you hate Rush. There's no, there's no in-between. Secondly, we are uh, both swimmers. <laughs> and yes, that is a picture of your pastor swimming right around the corner. I get these pictures out into the public so they can't be used against me. Um, but Brene Brown and I both love swimming, and she describes her love of swimming as being the perfect trifecta for introverts like us. It's simultaneously exercise, meditation, and alone time. She says the following of her swimming practice. She says, the only thing that can ruin a swim is when I shift my attention from my lane to what's happening in the lanes next to me. It's embarrassing, but if I'm not paying attention, uh, if I'm not paying attention, I can catch myself racing the person next to me or comparing our strokes or figuring out who has the best workout set. When I go into comparison, I completely lose the meditation and alone time that I need. And I once hurt my shoulder trying to race a 20-something triathlete in the lane next to me. Friends, comparing ourselves to one another is rarely something that nourishes our souls or builds up healthy community. Upward social comparison leaves us depressed and envious often. Downward social comparison often leaves us with a superiority complex, self-righteousness, and makes us decidedly unneighborly. But comparing ourselves to one another seems to be, as best as I can tell, unavoidable. We compare ourselves to one another almost subconsciously. I know the feeling well. When I'm swimming at uh, Club Fitness right around the corner on Lindu Street, and I see someone swimming in the lane next to me, I automatically, like Brene Brown, assess who's swimming faster. And just like Brene Brown, that's usually the precise moment that I stop focusing on my stroke fall out of rhythm, and in general, leave the meditative space that I came to that pool precisely to find. If I have a college triathlete swimming in the lane next to me, I immediately compare myself to them and feel like I'm too slow. If someone next to me is swimming rather slowly, for whatever reason, I give myself a mental pat on the back for being faster, and that leaves me feeling, well, not that great, because I don't think that's the person that Jesus is calling me to be. I believe it was Teddy Roosevelt who first coined the phrase, comparison is the thief of joy, and perhaps he was on to something. Because scripture is is full of examples of people comparing themselves with one another, because let's face it, that actually makes for some rather juicy stories. The first, of course, was Adam and Eve, who listens to the snake and began to compare themselves with God. Their son, Cain, took comparison, took the comparison game even further, and his brother Abel was the collateral damage. Leah and Rachel, Jacob and Esau, Saul and David, all of these stories involve conflict that begins with one person being compared to another, either by themselves or by another character in the plot. And today's passage is an example of such comparison. The parable that, uh, that Doug read and Brian sang for us is a story of a vineyard owner who has the audacity and the generosity to pay everyone the same amount, no matter how long they worked for him that day. Now, to be clear, he does not shortchange anyone. He pays the workers who worked for him the longest, no less than what they, he originally agreed 
to pay them. It's just that he decides to pay everyone else that amount, and that bothers the workers who had been there since daybreak. I always find it a bit funny that the landowner seems to deliberately cause this argument. You see, he lined up everyone to be paid. You, you take your paycheck and then you walk away. If he had started with the people who had been there all day, they would have taken their money and left and would have been none the wiser as to uh, their employer's graciousness. But the landowner deliberately starts with the workers who had only been there the shortest because he wanted those who had been there the whole day to see what he was doing. He was stirring the pot, and he knew it. And that stirred pot whipped up some pretty nasty words from the workers who had been there all day. They say, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. They're laying it on pretty thick, if you can't tell. Brene Brown would probably say that those disgruntled workers weren't paying attention to their own lane in the pool. Instead, they lost focus of their own journey and started gazing in their neighborhood lanes. Comparison rarely builds up community, and, and Jesus' message through this parable is one way of telling his followers that the economy of God's kingdom is not driven by the forces of comparison, upward or downward. And this is good news for the neighborhood because we have scientific research that suggests that comparison is actually the thief of joy and a barrier to meaningful relational connection. In her book, Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown quotes, um, quotes a, a research of someone named Frank Fujita who says the following about his research in comparison. He says, social comparisons can make us happy or unhappy. Upward comparisons can inspire or demoralize us, whereas downward comparisons make us feel uh, superior or depress us. In general, however, frequent social comparisons are not associated with life satisfaction or the positive emotions of love and joy, but are associated with the negative emotions of fear, anger, and shame. So if comparison tends to lead us to the emotions of fear, anger, and shame, then we should pay attention to that, because while none of those emotions, or any emotions for that matter, are in and of themselves bad, Decisions that are made from a place of fear and anger and shame tend to lead us to unhealthy places in our relationships. To use today's parable as an example, the workers who had been there all day could have chosen instead to celebrate that generous gift and reflect that generosity themselves towards others, but instead their downward comparison leads them to anger. So where does that leave us? When we're tempted to think we're not enough because we practice upward comparison, or the flip side, consider others not enough because of downward comparison, what do we do with that? What's the Christian response to living in a world hardwired for comparison? Well, first of all, as I said, we must acknowledge that comparing ourselves to one another, I think, is an inescapable part of being human. There's just no way around it. Comparing ourselves is just something that we do in ways that we realize and in ways that we don't. And though comparison isn't an emotion per se, we can still treat it as such. And while we, not, while we may not be able to avoid doing it, we do have the power to choose how we respond to it. How might we respond to the temptation of upward social comparison, those moments when the person in the lane next to us is swimming faster. Well, we can acknowledge that they are swimming faster and wish them well in their lane and return our focus to our own. I know it sounds simple. Guess what? It's not. <laughs> this takes time. It takes practice. How might we respond to the temptation of downward social comparison, the mo moments when the person in the lane next to us is swimming slower? Well, we can wish them well on their swim, help them to swim faster if that's something that they ask for, 
and then return our focus to our lane. Again, this takes time. It takes practice. From a theological perspective, we are reminded on this Communion Sunday that no matter how fast or how slow we are running our races or swimming in our lane, so to speak, we all eat at the same table and partake of the same cup and eat of the same bread. To use today's parable as a metaphor, we are all invited to partake of the same cup and the same bread, whether you have been here years and years or whether today is your first day ever stepping inside of a church building. We receive the same grace, the same forgiveness, the same salvation, and we can choose to resent that or we can choose to celebrate it. Friends, I get it. I feel not enough a lot. More often than not, what threatens my own mental health is less when others compare themselves to me, but when I compare myself to others. As a parent, I compare myself to other parents. As a preacher, I compare myself to other preachers. I do this too as a musician, a hymn writer, a swimmer, so on and so forth. And if I'm not careful, y'all, the rabbit hole of comparison can swallow me up and ironically become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you, like me, know that struggle, I offer to you some of the following concrete things I try to do to help myself, you know, help mitigate that rat race. This list is neither comprehensive or universal. These things may or may not work for you, but I encourage you to find whatever works best for you on your spiritual journey. Number one, hallelujah, is therapy. My weekly... <laughs> My weekly visit to my therapist, Laura, down on Green Street, is a chance for me to explore my emotions and talk with a trained mental health professional about how I can respond to those emotions in ways that are healthy for me and those that I love. When I'm tempted to focus on other lanes in the pool, Laura often encourages me to focus on my own lane and how I can have the best swim possible for me in that moment. Second is practicing Sabbath. Rest in whatever ways and forms we can find it and practice it is, ne is a necessary reset button that redirects our focus to a place of gratitude. I believe that if comparison is the thief of joy, then gratitude is the enemy of comparison. The other thing that Sabbath does is it reminds us all that if we take a break, the world does in fact keep on turning. And thirdly and finally is by surrounding myself with people who remind me that I am enough. Now, it might be tempting to think that if we surround ourselves with people that remind us that we are enough, that this would somehow lead us to a place of apathy, that it would lead us to abandon any attempts for self-improvement or growth, but that's just not true, at least not in my experience. In fact, I find the opposite to be true. When I surround myself with people who remind me that I'm enough, it actually inspires me to continue to try to be the best version of myself that I can be. To surround ourselves with people who remind us that we're enough is in no way to suggest, by the way, that we are not to be held accountable for when we hurt someone or mess up. In order to be a healthy human being, I need the same people who tell me that I'm enough tell me lovingly when I've done something to hurt someone else so that I can fix that behavior. Ultimately, the Christian response to comparison is to see one another the same way that God sees us, as people swimming in different lanes that are all worthy of the same good news. And that means that we uplift one another and encourage each other as we all swim our own races, so to speak. So I open this sermon with Brene, and I will close it with Bluey. <laughs> There's an episode of Bluey called Baby Race that starts with Bluey asking her mom if she is better at the monkey bars than her little sister, Bingo. Chili, the mom, decides to tell Bluey about how she started to walk as a baby. While surrounded by all the other moms and their babies, Bluey was the first one to roll over. Chili naturally beams with pride. Fast forward a few months, and Chili and Bluey are back with that same group of moms and their kids, and much to Chili's dismay, another child named Judo starts to sit up on her own before Bluey does. 
And later on, by the time Bluey learns to do the same, Judo has already learned how to crawl and then walk. As Chili begins to teach Bluey how to crawl, Chili gets a little bit worried because, well, Bluey starts to roll around instead on the floor. And then eventually, instead of crawling, Bluey shuffles around on her bum, uh, a, a, a bum shuffler is what it's uh, called, and then eventually does begin to crawl, but backwards. And as the other children begin to walk, Chili gets worried. She takes Bluey to the doctor to make sure that she's not doing anything wrong. The doctor insists that this is completely normal. This does little, however, to soothe Chili's feelings of inadequacy as a new parent. Another mom notices Chili's situation and comes over to their house one day. Her name is Bella, a pink poodle who is the mother of nine kids. Chili is amazed at this fact and says to Bella, you must have learned a thing or two, to which Bella replies, I have, and there's something you need to know. She looks directly at Chili and says, you're doing great. And from then on, Chili lets Bluey just do her thing and run her own race, and in time she begins to walk, and of course, all is well. Y'all, there are so many voices in this world that tell us that we're not enough. Not rich enough, popular enough, attractive enough, successful or powerful enough. We don't need more voices like that. What we do need are more voices like Bella who can assure us that we're doing all right, that we're doing great, that we are enough. The church is called to be that voice in the neighborhood. As followers of Jesus Christ, our faith in him is rooted in a man who practiced radical hospitality to persons who knew what it was like to be compared to others in ways that dehumanized them and caused them harm. So if we take his message seriously, we are all called to this table where God's voice gives us the assurance, the assurance that we are enough, just as we are, to receive God's grace and God's mercy. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, may all of us, God's beloved children, say, Amen. Amen.
neighbors, you may be seated. And with grateful hearts, let us together give of our tithes and our offerings. Gracious God, we give you thanks for these gifts, which we return to you. Give us the power and the wisdom of your Holy Spirit to use them wisely to build up this neighborhood, which we do so in your name, we pray. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. At this time, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. If you are uh, worshiping with us from home virtually and would like to go ahead and grab some bread, crackers, some juice, and wine, whatever you have nearby, you are invited to do so uh, to celebrate with us. I would invite us all to uh, join me in the responsive prayer of great thanksgiving that you'll find printed in your bulletin. Friends, God is here. God's Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, creating God, breath of all being. The earth is yours and all that is in it, and all who dwell therein. You founded it upon the seas and made it firm upon the deep. You planted seeds in fertile ground to rise and sing your praise. Glory to you forever. You formed us from the earth and planted goodness in our souls that we might love like you. You called us to live your law of harmony and to long for your commands. Yet when our disordered cravings bowed down our spirit, 
you did not leave us low, but bent down to meet us and grow us up again. Therefore, we lift our voices in thanksgiving, for you have wondrously made us. By water and your life-giving spirit, you have wondrously remade us to join the song of all creation and forever sing your praise. We give you thanks, O God, that you sowed your word in Jesus to grow your kingdom here on earth and draw us ever near. Jesus planted mercy wherever he went to reap a greater righteousness. He shared bread with outcasts and sinners and healed the brokenhearted. Glory to you forever. Friends, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his closest friends in an upper room. He took a loaf of bread, gave thanks for it, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, and do this, what? In remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he poured the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, shed in my blood for the forgiveness of of all sins. Take, drink, and do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ until he comes again. Friends, together we sing the mystery of faith. Remembering his dying and rising, we offer you this bread and this wine and ourselves in grateful service. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts and all of your people here today. Breathe your spirit over all creation that we together may cultivate peace in every corner of the world. And then bring us to that blessed mountain where with the meek and pure in heart we will live forever in blessedness as we taste the fruits of heaven. Glory to you forever. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, by the inspiration of your life-giving spirit, we worship you, creating God, in songs of endless praise. Blessed are you, now and forever. you will be invited to come forward in a moment and a piece of bread will be handed to you and to take a piece a cup of juice partake of the elements and then return by way of the side aisle we do have gluten-free elements if you uh, do require those just let your server know when you come up and as always if you are unable to come forward I will be walking around to simply uh, raise your hand and I will be happy to raise uh, to bring the elements to you Friends, you are enough, just as you are, to come to this table. You are enough in God's eyes. You are enough in our eyes. And because of that good news, 
We share it with one another. So friends, come to the table, for the table is set. I would now invite the uh, elders to come forward to serve communion.
been served? Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gifts that we find at this table. We give you thanks that you meet us as we are, but do not leave us as we were. So send us forth from this place with the knowledge and the trust that we are enough to do whatever it is that you are calling us to do as your disciples. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, we're so grateful you could join us uh, this day, either in person or online. Hope that you go forth with that good news, that in God's eyes, you are enough. May that be a strength to you this week. We invite you to join me in our responsive uh, charge and benediction. You'll find printed in your bulletin. It comes to us from the Iona community. And as I always say, is done best with vim and vigor. The cross, we will take it. The bread, we will break it. The joy, we will bear it. Uh, the, wait, sorry. <laughs> the pain, we will bear it. The joy, we will share it. The gospel, we will live it. The love, we will give it. The light, we will cherish it. And the darkness, God shall perish it. Go in peace.